<laughs> okay. Thank you. Over to you, Alexis. Awesome. So, um, everybody seeing slides okay? Yep. Okay. I can see cool. it and sound just fine. Awesome. So, super happy to be here today um, with my partner in crime, Kim Davies Hoffman. Um, <laughs> and I'll let her talk more in just a second, but just to get us started, um, we have a really quick presentation we're going to fly through. Um, we will have some time, hopefully, for questions and chat at the end. Um, so, please feel free to use the lively chat space. We love that. Um, and so, yes, we're here to talk about um, our lovely uh, book collection and sorry. Okay, there we go. So um, my name is Alexis McMillan Clifton. Um, I work for the State University of New York um, at Geneseo. Um, I'm an instructional support specialist. Um, and so right now my primary area of focus is working on making courses, course materials accessible, um, as well as open and inclusive. And Kim is here with us as well. She's the Director of Learning Initiatives at the River Campus Libraries um, for the University of Rochester. And so we're both based in the Rochester, New York, um, USA area. We're about six hours away from New York City. So if that's your frame of reference, if you're coming from outside the US, that's, that's roughly where we are. Um, let's see here. Okay, and we're here to talk about um, our project. And I'm so happy to see that Many of our collaborators um, are in the room with us today. So big shout out to everybody that helped us put this together. Um, this project is an edited collection of um, case studies using open pedagogy in higher education across the uh, United States. Um, it focuses primarily on open pedagogy projects that balance between um, teaching faculty in the classroom and some kind of partnership or collaboration with the academic libraries on their campuses. And so, and we say library rather than librarian for a purpose. I mean, librarians are super important, um, but there are also others in, that work in libraries that definitely collaborated that don't necessarily have that librarian role. So we're pretty careful about that wording. Um, and so, yeah, we had a lot of great partners um, that are listed here and we can talk more about how the book works. Um, I'll put the link to the book in the chat in just a second, but there's the bit.ly there as well. We published it in July of this year. We started it about two years ago at this point. Um, so the world changed a lot in that process, but you know, we, we still managed, thanks to Kim, to get it out on time. So if you ever need to actually get something done, work with Kim, that's my big plug there. So, Kim. Thanks, Alexis. Yeah, it's amazing that we got it done on time, uh, given all the, the tumultuous nature of our world. So, um, so this slide talks about um, the metacognitive strategy that was at the core of open pedagogy approaches. Um, and so this was not like any other book, if you really want to think of the meta nature. So if we kind of follow this cycle uh, counterclockwise, um, this book is an OER collection of case studies about OER and open pedagogy, so incredibly meta. Um, and it highlights the innovation that can happen when faculty, libraries, and students work together. Uh, it's also a model for open practices in publishing, as the editorial board was extremely careful to um, practice what we preach in our adherence to how OER work best, and that is um, adopting different documents, modifying them, sharing them back out to the world, um, and also the positives that transparency of process can bring when you're working with so many different contributors. Uh, next bottom corner there, the book is in itself an example of open pedagogy as we converted a copy editing course that was happening at the University of Rochester at just the right time. Um, we converted the course into an open pedagogy uh, case study where the eight students of that course became copy editors for the book. And so they were modifying an OER at the time um, that they were practicing certain skills that were very valuable to us. And finally, up at the top corner, um, this is now a string springboard for those who were involved in making the book come together as we can continue the practices that we learned throughout the process of the book 
And then for those who read the chapters, they can rethink um, how they might re, uh, reimagine their pedagogy based on some of the samples that they're seeing through the book. Next slide, Lex. And with so many contributors on this book, um, we approach the work with our own individual motivation, motivations. Um, but in general, I think you'll see that a lot of them kind of came down to these four core motivations. Um, so as you can see, there's many more conferences and publications about OER and open pedagogy as we continue down this path of the open movement. And so particularly our ed editorial board was really interested in learning more about these issues. Um, social justice and equity issues, of course, were front of mind for our different contributors, um, as this is a way to level the playing field across higher education and provide student agency for the learning that they're involved in during college. Faculty library student collaborations. This is certainly near and dear um, to a librarian's heart um, as we try to shed old stereotypes and really highlight what those different roles within libraries can do when they work with faculty and with students. And then finally, professional development um, for each individual that worked on this book, for the group as a whole, working with the Rebus community, we learned a lot. And we can all become stronger at what we do when we practice what we preach, when we apply some of these lessons, and then we can move some of this learning forward to the people that we work with. So uh, the next slide provides just a few samples from our contributors of specific quotes of what they found valuable um, in getting involved with the book. Amanda Wentworth, she was one of our peer reviewers and she speaks specifically to the diverse perspectives that are added to this book. Um, and then we can all learn from each other when we work together. And Sarah Myers, one of our copy editors, really played into the professional development side of motivation. And she was interested in how to get involved in an open publishing project. And so she put herself out there. She worked on this opportunity to deepen her own involvement. And so she can take that learning forward. And so I got to say, like Sarah's uh, interest, all the whole editorial board kind of coalesced together because we were all interested in how you make an open scholarly work. Um, and so each of us had done pieces of different kinds of publishing or scholarly publishing before, but putting it all together when you add in the open license, the open process of book development and um, the open scholarship it entailed, that was new as a new combination to all eight or nine of us that ended up on the board of uh, the editorial board. Um, so early on, we really, once we decided that we did want to work on a book project, our primary goal was, well, we want the final product to be open and openly licensed. And so setting that as our destination point really dictated how we got there along the way. And so um, we did things like an, uh, we published the rubric for, with when we put out our call for chapter proposals, which was kind of scary and new for many of us. Um, we, everything's openly licensed. We borrowed heavily from existing resources. Thanks so much to the Rebus community woot, woot, that have already put a lot of this stuff together for us. Um, and so because ours was a scholarly work rather than a textbook, we had to adapt some things. So we definitely paid it forward and included everything that we used with an open license. And it's part of the book itself now, um, as well as existing on the Rebus community page. Um, you know, and again, that was a driving force and really as, as uh, one of our editor editorial board team members, um, Dr. Deborah Russell Mill says, you know, that's that transparent process really was everything we did from that framework really shaped the, the content that we got in return and that we were able to put back forward once we put the book together. And um, the second quote here is from the instructor of that copy editing course at the University of Rochester that said, you know, using Google Drive really helps um, us collaborate with the students um, and the students collaborate with the authors without ever having to see one another, especially once um, 
the COVID lockdown hit and everybody was working remotely and, and had no opportunity to gather in person anyway. Um, Okay, so really quickly, we ended up with four sections of the book. Um, these were very much driven. We had kind of a framework of what we thought people would want to talk about when it came to open pedagogy projects related to libraries. Um, and we, but we really were open to shaping the book in terms of what we got back in terms of the chapter proposals and the final projects that were submitted. And so we ended up with four sections. Um, and this first one, um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of groundwork to cover when you're talking about open pedagogy, and so we really wanted a, a, a devoted section of the book to cover that. And different chapters in the book use the term open pedagogy or open enabled pedagogy quite differently, and we wanted some grounding conversations about why that is and why that's okay, and we can be flexible about that. Um, there are still several case studies in that first chapter, including um, a chapter by Stacey Katz and Jennifer Van Allen, who I believe are both here and are presenting a poster at this conference. So a little plug for them, go check out their fabulous poster. Um, they have a really nice case study that includes a detailed workflow of how you start from a traditional course assignment and move it along the process to becoming an open pedagogy assignment. Um, so they, uh, there is a case study for how this happened in their class. There's a lot of material here you can pick up and apply to other classrooms as well. So really nice resource sharing throughout the chapters. And so our second section, um, I feel is when people say OER, or open pedagogy, like textbook replacement seems to be the thing that comes to people's mind. Um, so we certainly wanted to highlight that. Um, and this section is filled with chapters on different ways that um, the teams, professors, faculty, um, libraries, and students were helping to save students money as well as to extend access so that everyone has um, that opportunity to get to the reading material from the first day of class. So uh, just as one example, <clears throat> we have Humanities in the Open by Beck et al. And uh, rather than the traditional five R's of OER, um, this was a case where the professor used public domain classical literary texts and, and brought those into one anthology um, so that students would have free access to the reading materials rather than buying you know, individual um, manuscripts and, and novels. And so um, to bring it into the open pedagogy realm as well, not just for the readings, but students would then annotate this anthology of the classic texts, some going back to ancient times, and were asked to annotate using modern day parallel examples. Um, and so this was meant to really showcase the universality of the writing, even if it was written in ancient times, how do we understand that um, based on a modern day lens? So section three of our book um, takes on several case studies um, that concern content creation, um, specifically as a graded or you know a core course of the of the course content. And so um, we start seeing some really fun things come out of this chapter or these the chapters in this section. Um, there's some kind of product that the students are producing and sharing with the world, that world may be, you know, limited to their um, campus, or it may be more broadly published, but there's some really fun things that come out of uh, the chapters here. Um, again, I'm going to put in another plug for a session that's happening later today by this team. Um, yeah, I did include their names. Okay, wasn't where I was expecting it on the screen. But, um, this team of authors um, discussed the uh, a Spanish linguistics textbook that they collaborated with several students over several semesters to build. Um, and not just the content of the book, but there's also the illustrations, the book cover and book design are all student generated and led. Um, and so it, it fills a gap for a textbook that doesn't really exist. And um, it's incredibly useful and vibrant and fun to look at, even if you don't speak Spanish. <laughs> um, so check out their session a little later today. Okay, and finally, um, section four really plays on the attributes of open pedagogy rather than being 
the pure OER enabled pedagogy that you might um, read about. But um, this section is all about where there is course structure and there are goals and learning outcomes um, and milestones to get students to an end product. But there's a lot of flexibility within that design to have the students really lead their learning and, and play with that syllabus and, and how they're going to progress in the semester um, based on what makes sense in terms of the learning. Um, so this one is, is the least of the OER enabled um, definitions of open pedagogy, but certainly plays to attributes like student agency and access and building community, taking risks, all of that. Um, and so just a couple of examples here. I'll go really quick because we are at time, but uh, hopefully we can take a few more minutes. Um, but one case here where students, you know, built a simulated NGO from the ground up. And so some guidance, but basically they took it where they needed to based on their team and their motivations. And then the second example, Malloy and Siddiqui, was uh, students transforming the traditional research paper into multimodal presentations that represented that research. Um, so again, students really had a lot of leeway in what they could do with that transformation. So finally, uh, where does this lead us professionally? Um, I would say that among all the contributors, and I'd say that there's 145 in total, plus the Rebus community, we all have a better understanding of the scholarly public publishing process. Um, this goes for the online version of the book. There's also a downloadable version and print on demand. So as I mentioned earlier, the more that we understand the process, the better we can assist others with it. Uh, fellowships, I happen to be part of Sparks Open Education Leadership Program. Um, and I was able to tie this book's process with my capstone project in creating awareness on campus for these issues. Uh, professional rec recognition, I think that all the contributors um, are getting that recognition um, because we have been involved in local and national and international conferences and other publications. Um, so we're all kind of playing a part in this movement forward with OPEN. And then finally, the community that was built around this book is truly amazing. Like I mentioned, 145 contributors um, plus the Rebus community, which served as our backbone. Um, and again, with each of these individuals, a ripple effect takes place. You know, we've learned something, and so we bring that forward to take that learning a little bit further. And we have just a few quotes to round us out here. Can um, Can I suggest that we maybe skip the quotes just in the interest of time and? Um... Sure. If people have, uh, I see Stacy's chatting about the, the experience, which I really appreciate. Um, are there other comments or questions that we can answer really quickly in like a minute and a half or something like that? <laughs> Before Paul breaks out the big cane and pulls us off the stage. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, please, please feel free to um, put a question in chat or if you'd like to turn your mic on, you're welcome to. This is awesome work. <laughs> it's really awesome work and um, maybe I'll say briefly that links to this work are in the OEG Connect space, which I just linked to in chat, uh, as well as actually to the podcast that uh, was done about this work and it's very inspiring and I hope to see more and more people adopt sort of open pedagogy practices. So there's just lots of kudos in chat, not many questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, if questions come up, we definitely are reachable through the book. There are several ways to contact us and the authors in the book, um, as well as throughout this conference. I'll be around the whole time. I'm really excited about everything. And it's nice to see new names as well as our, our good friends as part of this collaboration and here in the room. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll if just I could just add one more thing, the last link on this page, um, it's a series of workshops, presentations from our authors that will be occurring uh, from this week through January. So if you want to dig into any of the chapters, the authors are going to be speaking about them. Yes, good point. Thank you. That's fantastic. Yeah, please include those up in that OEG Connect space. And, and it's worth noting as well that that space in OEG Connect also allows discussion so people can actually post questions or have uh, leave some um, comments for you there as well.
thank you. Thank you both, Kim and Alexis, for doing this uh, fantastic stuff. And, uh, and with that, um, this session of three presentations comes to an end. We can stop the recording, Emily.